Welcome to the Reach Australia podcast. We've got a special edition. We're looking at the topic of what is a pastor. And I've got Andrew Hurd, uh, lead pastor at EV Church and part of the Reach Australia team speaking with us today. And I've also got Paul uh, Grimman from Moore College. He's the Dean of Students there and responsible particularly for seeing them uh, grow and be shaped in their, in their ministry. Hurdy, you've spoken a little bit about the importance of the language of a pastor and its impact on growth. Can you flesh that out a bit more for us? Yeah, look, my concern for the issue is that I think we've often conceived the language of pastor in such a way that we've built into our churches uh, an inherent limiter on growth. And, and that's an okay thing if the Bible requires us to think of pastor the way we've often thought about it. Um, but if we've taken the word pastor from the New Testament and given it a shape that's not quite its biblical shape, required that to be the way it must be, which then limits growth, that's a crazy thing, crazy place. So, so what is the shape? Like how, how have we understood pastoral ministry unhelpfully? Unhelpfully? Um, there's a few ways. I think one of the key ways in my mind is with, um, and I've, I've often seen it in uh, an American author particularly who talks about pastoring as insistently personal. Mm. Um, but he then, which I think is legitimate, I think that's a wonderfully appropriate expression insistently personal, but expresses that insistent personal shape in a way that means you must know all the people in your church, you must be in their houses, you must know their names. Um, So to be pastoral is to be the kind of leader who um, is in everybody's life. Mm. And if that is true, and if that's what the biblical record's saying, I'm, I'm there, whatever impact it has on church. But what it certainly does is it creates a church that can't grow larger than the pastor can know. Now, for some people, that might be 200, um, but for most people, it ends up about 150. Mm. Um, and is that really the uh, is the biblical record constraining us to that shape? And th- there's a sense that is a right picture from you know from the New Testament and from the Old Testament as we think about shepherd. You know, the idea of caring, uh, knowing your sheep. We you know we see that in in the Gospels. John 10, yeah. Yeah, so, so, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well yes, the, the, undoubtedly the language of pastor, which is, of course, the word shepherd, um, is used to say that there's a kind of leadership. Uh, so undoubtedly, again, shepherd pastor has the idea of leadership inherent in it, mm. Numbers 27 and Psalm 77 and 78 and so on. Undoubtedly, the language of pastor shepherd has lead in it, and it's seeking to express, I would offer, um, a kind of leadership that is a a warm leadership, it's a personally concerned for the sheep leadership. Uh, So it's used in the ancient era often um, as a way of colouring the king to not just be a ruler leader, but to be a certain kind of one who Mm. cares, who feeds, who guides, who protects. Um, And certainly that image is what's being picked up in throughout the Bible, but in the New Testament, the, the good shepherd. John 10 and so on. Um, and so where to be shepherds, of course, where to be pastoring, not just ruling, but loving, caring, uh, being with. So insistently personal is an undergirding shape to it, absolutely. Mm. Paul, you want to weigh in? What else is the... Well, I, I mean, I wonder whether one of the key problems is actually what happens when... Um, the sh- you talked about the shape that that insistently personal gets given. Yeah. Um, so I think the guy that you're talking about talks about kind of being in people's lives, being in their homes, and knowing everyone's name. I actually wonder that whether there's even a distinction there. That is, um, if I had a pastor who was never in anybody's home, I think I'd be concerned about that because there's just like there's a there's an EQ, an understanding of people yeah, yeah, that you've yeah, got to have. Yeah, I think yeah. if you're going to preach well, connect with people, yeah. um, you've actually got to be with real people. But is that the same thing as knowing every sheep's name? So yes, is there, is there yes, a distinction yes. between I have to know personally every single person in the congregation mm. versus I have to be involved at some level in the personal lives of some people somewhere so that I'm yeah. human and real in relationship with them? Which is what this man's contending for. He's, he's, he's reacting against the CEO kind of pastor, sure. mm-hmm. yeah. the, the, the leader who sits in an office above it all, um, separate from it, pulling levers, Running business meetings, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, and and that that is antithetical to the shape of 
pastor in the New Testament. A- absolutely. Mm. So 1 Peter 5, you know, we've got to be an example to the sheep. Yeah. All the qualifications for pastor are about character and personal life. Um, it's beautiful. In Acts chapter 20, you know, Paul talks about shepherd the sheep. You know, it, it, this is the church he bought with his own blood. Um, yeah. Although, interestingly, even in Acts 20, he's actually talking, it seems to me, to a group of elders rather than just to one yeah. individual elder, right? So he's not saying, <laughs> he's saying to all of you together, shepherd the sheep. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I wonder how much we need to kind of think about that distinction as well. Yeah. So, like, um, as a church grows in size, does the person who is kind of the lead pastor, the person who's responsible at one level over it all, do they need to know everybody? Do they need to make sure that there are people somewhere who know people uh, in such a way that the gospel is yeah. going to be proclaimed, that the realities of the truth of how the Bible actually applies to individuals gets brought home in some way or another in relationship yeah. with people? I don't and, know. Like, and I would offer, I, I think you. this is where you get a little bit, there's a complexity with the Old Testament into the New Testament. Yeah. Mm. But certainly the Old Testament, you've got language of, the shepherd of Israel is, is, is Moses, is Aaron. You, you've got that kind of uh, imagery where um, if being a pastor in the Old Testament required knowing everybody's name, I mean, those guys are very busy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in everybody's house, it's going to be a pretty, pretty hot, hot job. Yeah. Um, and the fact that it's used as the kings, right? So David, yeah, yeah. Um, particularly kingship and, and lead. So if you look at the, the main spaces where the pastor language is used it's moses and it's david yeah um neither of whom i suspect you would describe as being in everybody's home or actually knowing every individual Mm -hmm. name within israel but they do offer leadership care protection guidance uh, and encouragement for the whole nation to sit under the lordship of god Mm -hmm. uh, and to live faithfully and so one of the big questions for us is how much is there such a transition of the language into the new testament that that the ability to pastor a large group changes hmm. such that it can only be a group that you know everybody's name now. Yeah. Um, and, and I, you know, I remain convinced that, that if that transition happened, there'd be much more in the New Testament about how we ought to change. Hmm. Um, but I think rather it comes from sort of seeing Jesus, the good shepherd who knows them by name. It comes from the 1 Thessalonians 2 picture of, Paul and his example with the Thessalonians and the love that he had for them as a mother, yep. as a father. Yep. And I think it's often that picture is then taken and um, expanded to say, this is the only way a pastor can be. Um, but I don't think the New Testament would allow that. I, yeah. Well, we, yeah, what, no, what are the other pictures that we see Paul using in the New Testament of, uh, of a pastoral ministry? Slave, uh, overseer, yep. Yep. midwife, uh, I mean, that'd be scary, having lots of midwives <laughs> as pastors, <laughs> slave. Yeah. I mean, the overseer is interesting language as well, isn't it? Yeah. So um, as the New Testament pushes into things like eldership and overseer and whatever, mm. each of those words has a different flavour to it, right? So pastor has a bunch of these connotations. You get into the overseer language and there's a kind of, there. I think there is an organisational responsibility for the thing that's in front of you kind mm-hmm. of thing that goes on. There's... Um, so that's the able to te- well able to teach is is often there, but also the able to lead your household well. Yeah, yeah. Whereas I, I think probably it, able to teach probably more as a the pastor elder mm. um, overseer able to lead your family well is, is probably there's a, a shape flavour to those words more mm. along those lines. Yeah, because you've got the Ephesians four and the pastor teacher, so that thing is bound together. Mm. Um, able to teach because that's the way you pastor. Um, a key piece in pastoring is is feeding the sheep, yeah, protecting, guarding um, yeah. against evil, against sin, against error. Um, yeah, but the overseer language captures very clearly, doesn't it? The management, organisation, yeah, definitely vision yeah. setting. Uh, and Anna Carson says that you know if you're going to take the New Testament language seriously. Uh, it's about more than just personal relationship. Yeah. So he says you can actually have a guy who's a really good teacher who shouldn't actually be an overseer. Yes. Um, because he pushes it pretty he, hard. He pushes it hard. Right. Like that. There's yeah. those things are. Um, they're both different skill sets, if you like. Yeah. Um, and having one doesn't automatically imply the other. Yeah. And the kind of person that you're looking for the overseer elder role uh, needs to embody kind of a bunch of different things yeah. in that yeah. space. I think. And it is interesting to lead your family well. 
I mean, you're not talking about a nuclear family of mum, dad, two kids. <laughs> do you know what I mean? And a dog. It doesn't take much to lead well. Um, <laughs> it's very laissez-faire. But yeah, if you're talking a household, that, that is a management exercise. Yeah. You know? you, you, I mean, we've got families uh, in church who, you know, seven, eight, nine kids. I mean, that's, you know, you're talking military precision to make that work. Yeah, yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, that's quite a leadership. Now, it, it's helpful. It's a really helpful paper that helps raise this topic and helps uh, push uh, into it for us and really opens it up. I guess one of the questions I've got is, this was a book that was written 20 years ago. Is this still a problem um, today for today's pastors coming through, I'll ask you, and then and the pastors that you're interacting with through yeah, coaching good. and through leading? So is it a problem at colleges that we've got a wrong view of pastoral ministry and pastor? Oh, I think that's a really interesting question. I think we've got students coming from a wide, like a, you know, a, a wide range of backgrounds, and so different people kind of carrying different things into the space. Yep. Um, I think they feel... Um, if I'm honest, I think most people come into college with a deep sense of they are supposed to be responsible for people. Um, and so there's a deep kind of weight that students carry into that space. Yep. Um, so I think they come in knowing I'm supposed to know people, I'm supposed to be responsible for them, I'm supposed to kind of that kind of stuff. I think there's an anxiety about disappointing people mm -hmm. uh, or um, saying things that are going to upset or hurt or offend people. So I think our, our sensitivity what it means to have been wronged or to say something that might hurt or disappoint someone is really strong. Mm. So I think that's affecting students and their perception of what being a pastor is and how that works. And there's, there's a, in the shepherd role, there is that you've got to be, you know, harsh and gentle uh, or protector and, and gentle at times as well. There's a, there's a, there's a dual role as you uh, rebuke and discipline and disciple people. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it, that, um, I mean, one of the key roles, it seems to me, certainly Titus and 1 Timothy, uh, is to rebuke the false teachers, uh, and even at times to rebuke the, the people harshly. It seems that, like uh, he uses that really strong language uh, in Titus chapter 1 about making sure you rebuke them. And, you know, when he talks about the Cretans are always lazy brute, brutes and evil gluttons and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and then you've got to firmly warn them and et cetera, et cetera. So there's, there's, there's this both kind of, strong stand up not take any nonsense stuff and then you know you flip over to 1 Thessalonians and you've got I'm a mother and a father who mm -hmm. nurtures and cares for people mm -hmm. um, I wonder whether it's actually learning that you need to work out how to be both of those people uh, and the, the problem is working out when to be which one mm -hmm. <laughs> so I wonder sometimes whether particularly inexperience means that you end up being militant when you should be gentle <laughs> And you end up being gentle when you should be yeah, militant, yeah, I totally. suspect. Which is why earlier on you talked about the importance of EQ. Um, yep. And uh, we've, been, we've been talking lots in the development program about uh, the importance of identity and understanding you know, uh, your identity in Christ yep. and how identity issues often sabotage your leadership. Um, can you speak into that? <laughs> how are you going? Can, can <laughs> I just think just it's, so yes. I think it's huge, right? I think it, that that is absolutely huge. Yep. I mean, I think one of the things that we've worked on really hard at college over the last few years is just developing students' sense of kind of personal awareness mm -hmm. uh, and emotional awareness, mm -hmm. and realizing how much when you get into conflict or difficulty in relationship or whatever, um, you you often react out of things that have been provoked in you that mm -hmm. have been caused by history and your particular sensitivity to sin in, in individual places and whatever. Mm. Um, and as soon as the temperature rises in a conflict situation, you kind of revert to a particular type and it's different for different people. Mm. Uh, but, you know, does that mean that you, you automatically, you try to escalate the conflict in order to bring it to an end, for example, which is what I was saying before about when do you need to be gentle and listen, when do you need to ele ele elevate and kind of make it bigger or whatever. Um, depending upon your personality, you either shrink away and avoid it completely, so you've got to actually work at pushing harder, or you're the kind of person who goes, as soon as I see a conflict, I've got to squash it and make it disappear, mm. um, and it stops you from listening. So sometimes those, some of those guys that I've seen end up having conflicts that they don't need to have mm. just because they weren't actually listening to what was going on mm. for people. So I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I think the challenge in that, though, is uh, as you see those different contexts, uh, you will instinctively think I'm right in assessing that this needs to be squashed or this needs yeah. to be gentled. Yeah. And, and, and you won't even see in yourself that you've brought a way of being and, and viewing things to sure. it. 
Yeah. Uh, and so there's the self-awareness piece. Yeah. yeah. But I, I, I'd offer just a little touch more. I think um, d- just on the language of pastor, I do think um, I, I'd be interested. I think I think there's a potential for young guys coming and girls coming into college to to cut to be captured by a vision of wanting to do more. Mm. Um, and there being a temptation to move towards the CEO kind of model. I think there is, you know, the ambitious young, I want to actually make a difference and so on. Um, but I think over time, they can be very helpfully captured to the language of pastor as a personal work, as a, as a uh, lead, but with protection, feed, guard, care. Mm. Um, but I think then when they go into a church setting, there's so much of a culture in our existing churches that the pastor is a certain kind of person doing a certain kind of role mm. that it will be easy, it is easy, for that language then to trigger um, their own uh, sensitive conscience about honouring God with these people, yeah. which can draw them by that language of pastor into being someone who just does the close people work. Mm. And I, I think we do at that point need to help them break free from that word as the congregation understands it, to see that there's more latitude the Bible gives them into exercising the role of pastor. Yeah. There can be a bigger word. Well, uh, but it's interesting too, thinking about what happens in that space, right? So I start to feel the burden for these people. I get involved in their lives. Mm. Um, that sucks a lot of energy. Like the yeah. more you do that, that can suck energy away from other responsibilities that also exist for you as a yeah. pastor. Yeah. So, for example, it seems to me that teaching the scriptures well Sunday by Sunday is part of creating a whole culture of kind of obedience and desire to mm. love Jesus and to live faithfully in light of His Lordship. Yeah. Um, if I spend less and less time doing that, then I'm actually ignoring what I would call a pastoring function. Uh, that exists for the whole sake of the congregation yeah, critical. Out, out of a sense of responsibility and etc 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 so yeah. even as we think about what's the emphasis of the metaphor or how do we construct the metaphor of pastor um, where's the burden of the language and where does the emotional center of that hit us yeah, nice. and what does that kind of lead us to yeah, do yeah, I yeah, guess? Yeah. Yeah. and and if it doesn't lead us to see that a key way we pastor, not the only thing, but a key thing we bring as the pastor is the feeding, yeah. is the protecting guardian yeah, yeah, yeah. through the word ministries. Yeah. If we don't bring that strong instinct, very few congregations will affirm it in us. Hmm. Do you know I mean? Very few congregations are going to give us the feedback regularly that uh, it's fantastic you spend the time preparing to deliver us yeah. a meal each week. Mm. Um, they're not going to affirm us in that. They want us to be in the hospital with them. Yeah. And so, you know, cultivating in the young pastor a sense that that's a core piece and a way they do pastor uh, is helpful. So, so there's two sides. Though. There's, there's the, the pastor having a right understanding of this, but there's also the congregation yeah. and the congregational member having a right understanding. And the role of pastor is actually to teach uh, and to equip the people to actually have a right understanding. Because, Absolutely. Because we're, and, and, or reshaping even. But the problem is, uh, the problem is the pastor teaching what the pastor is in, inevitably gets tripped up with this is a personally driven agenda mm. for me. Do you mean I'm telling you what I'm going to be? It inevitably carries with it a sense of ego. With it, so it's me and my place, mm. and so it's actually for the healthy pastor, it's hard to do that. Because you don't want to talk up yourself and talk about yourself. Mm. Um, and you don't want to tell them how they should think about you. Uh, so that becomes actually a tricky exercise, I think. <laughs> Have you got uh, some tips? Or well, one of, the ti- one of the tips is being so, in my mind, one, one of the tips is being so clear in yourself what you are mm. that it doesn't matter what they think. Do, do you know what I mean? So that, so that you can be who you need to be even though people are pushing you elsewhere. I think that's one of the mm. fundamental core things there are other ways to instruct and help as well, but I think that's a that's a strong piece. Mm. Yeah, and again, that's tricky, isn't it? Yeah. So, um, uh, <laughs> I, like, I can think of some people who were very clear in themselves about what they who wanted to be in such a way that no criticism ever actually yeah. <laughs> yeah. kind of gone yeah. through the thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think that you're absolutely right. Like, yeah, you actually yeah. need to you need to be able to 
find a way of having enough distance from your space to say, what are the key roles that I inhabit? Or what yeah, are the key yeah. things that I do as a pastor of this congregation? And am I actually balancing my responsibility in each of those spaces? Am I thinking about myself as someone who's teaching the word, feeding, caring for, and loving the sheep by refuting error and teaching them what yeah. the, the glory of Jesus looks like? And that's where the growth barriers literature, the books are quite helpful in helping us see that that's going to change as, as a church grows. I, I think absolutely, yeah, yeah. Because, yes, in addition to, uh, you know, feed and so on and so forth, uh, care, protect, guard, is, is build an, uh, a body mm. with all the various gifts applied yeah. to facilitate all of that happening beyond what you could do. Mm. And so paying attention to that piece as well is pastoring. Um, uh, yeah. But, yes, in a context, you need to do all of this open to... Uh, feedback, yeah, yeah, which is your very point. Yeah. So, but we did uh, we did this fascinating exercise with our fourth year students uh, just yesterday, actually, where I kind of said to them, you know, um, describe all the tasks that you currently do as a student minister. Now, describe which ones only you could do and which ones other people could do. And they got a list. And I said, those ones that other people could do, why can't you give them up? And it was fascinating the list of things that kind of came back in terms of their awareness of, well, sometimes it's because of. I just feel good about doing them yeah, or sometimes yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm anxious and proud about kind of someone doing them better than me mm. uh, or sometimes uh, the cur- you know, the energy curve that's required to actually get someone else to do them is too high for me to feel like I can nice. get over at the that's moment. Right. So I'm kind of, that's I'm right. just going to keep doing them even though I have to do them faster that's and right. faster and faster. Which is um, a short term solution. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Care, but but I, like it, uh, one of the things that's really struck me about the pastor thing mm. Um, having long-term vision yeah. and realising what you're sacrificing long-term by the short-term decisions that you're making. And I just think that means you need some way of getting enough out of your context to gain some perspective to yeah. say, yeah. what are my contributions going to make to the way that the system runs? Yeah. Uh, and what's that doing to shape a system long-term and where that system is going to run up against kind of constriction points or boundaries because of just the very nature of the system and realising that as the leader, I contribute massively to the shape of that system. Yeah, and, and to do that exercise for the good of the whole. This is exactly Absolutely. the point, isn't it? So, yeah. so the reason I'm, I'm empowered, for me, the reason I'm empowered to step back and do that um, and sometimes let go of things in the immediate short term, the, the thing that empowers me to do that is this is for... Uh, the blessing of the people I'm called to lead yep. and pastor. And so if I don't do that, I will sell them short. Um, and, and so, yeah, that strengthens me to take charge of my life and mm. help me do those things. But, but so too does a, um, a, a deep enough appreciation of the language of pastor, that, that I have actually biblically the freedom to do that. I know. Um, that the language doesn't require me to only be one kind of thing. If you're enjoying this conversation, don't forget to get your free ebook at reachaustralia.com.au forward slash resources. Someone might be listening to this and think, I should never meet with my people. You know, if I want to be a good pastor, if I actually want to see the church grow, then I ought to be, you know, not wasting my time meeting up with with my people. That that's not what you're saying, is it? Oh, not at all. And and <laughs> and there's a beautiful thing, isn't it? With, with the person of Jesus, with Saint Paul. Um, with Jesus, he's, he's a very driven mm. person. You know, he's going to the cross. He's not going to be distracted from the cross. Um, but on the way, I mean, he didn't come, you know, Mark chapter 1, I, I came to teach. Yep. Uh, so he turns away from healing. But on the way to Jerusalem, you know, out of compassion, he turns aside on occasion. Mm. Um, Paul, uh, in his ministry, so the 1 Thessalonians one is a great one here, where he, he leaves them. He does move on because he's got to get to Rome. He's got to get to other places. But while he's there, the character of the pastor can't but be drawn to be involved. Mm. And I think that's Jesus can't but be drawn to do what he can on the way. And I think, I think there's a character to the pastor that, that um, sees the bigger picture but can't but also be drawn into the moments of life mm. with people that you move together with. And if you aren't that kind of person who keeps on occasion being drawn into that and finding the need to be drawn into that, we don't want you in the pastoral ministry. You know, mm-hmm. it's, um, 
we don't want you in the back office. You know. To what extent, Andrew, do you reckon that that's like one of the things that I'm thinking about too? Like we talked about life cycle of church, right? But there's a life cycle of a pastor as well, right? Yeah, yeah. So you actually, you start out, <laughs> there's kind of lots of enthusiasm. Is there, that you kind of need to, and we're talking about different skill sets. Um, is there a sense that you need some time immersed with people? You need to kind of beaver away at preparing the scriptures and teaching them. Yeah, you need to be yeah. thinking organisationally and big picture about gathering yeah. people and using others' gifts and all of those kinds of things. Um, but realising that each of those are different elements of the skill set of a pastor mm. and how you're going to develop those over your life as a pastor. Yeah. Maybe you don't get them all in one hit, I think. That's good. And also, uh, so, so there's, a, there's a reality about diarising your life. You've got to, um, yeah. uh, you know, I need to find, I need to find the alone time to work on a passage and so on and so yeah. forth. But in my week, where am I going to build structure to be with people? Um, you know, for me, for instance, Sundays after services uh, is intentionally a strategic time to be unstrategic. Mm. You know, I mean, <laughs> I, I intentionally don't plan who to talk to. I intentionally be available. Um, now, there's a danger with that because often the people who come to me are, are um, either deeply needy or without any personal awareness of their life and, and so they're always the one who just bowls up to you. And you so, so I have to sometimes guard that, but I want to be available. Mm. Um, there's another thing I'd add to it, is, which is personality. Some people are extroverts, yeah. some people are introverts, yep. aren't they? So um, I think learning yourself over time, um, yeah. you know, I think you've probably spent a lot of time in this kind of realm as well where over time if I operate this certain way given who I am I'm going to die it'll mm. just so um, learning to manage myself for the long term so the introvert that I am means I need to pay attention to getting more alone time but never retreating into that only yeah there's a capacity issue as well as a, as a bandwidth issue as well I guess you've got to pay attention to and some have a greater one than others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and being okay with it. Now, I'm, I'm interested because we talk about the, the young pastor at college. You're coaching a lot of church planters. You're, you know, you've, you're talking with a lot of leaders who have been in ministry. So much of, um, of what you do as a pastor has been shaped by, you know, that, that first minister that you, you know, first pastoral minister you have sort of post college or, or the minister you had that kind of sent you to college, you've been shaped by a, a model. Any and all of them. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, how, like, we, we've got some good models out there. We've got some bad models. Um, often the model that we've seen has been of the solo, you know, the solo pastor. Yeah. We haven't seen a lot of team pastoring models. We haven't seen a lot of specialist um, pastoring models either where, you know, where someone's been set aside to just focus on, uh, you know, a function or a area yeah. of church life. Um, can you speak into some of the complexity of, you know, understanding yourself or uh, understanding what a pastor is from... You know, only having that one model. Look, I, I think one of the uh, one of the blessings of the training system I operated in mm. was that they they insisted we had a number of models. Mm. And so, you know, I think more college does this. I think it's a, it's a strength where there's a danger if you've grown up in one church uh, and train at a college in that one church and go back to that one church. There's a it's not wrong. Um, you know, I think Spurgeon probably. You know, it's, there's People yeah. who did yeah. it, yeah. Yeah. you know, um, but but it's not. Um, there's a strength for most of us to actually experience a number of different leadership styles and people mm. uh, to see how they each operate, which means you can then assess the positives and negatives better. You're you're more aware. Um, so that's been you know that was my history, and I dare say that's been yours too. Oh, yeah. totally. Yeah, yeah. 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 There's yeah. a great strength. I, I I think if you're going to get a man back to your church, you want to have sent them away before they come back. Mm. They'll come back much better for it. Um, but being, um, being driven by outcomes for mine has always helped me uh, have the, the better questions to ask of whatever model I'm looking at. Um, if our big concern as pastors is to, is to make mature disciples, mm. that in my mind, to the glory of God, if that's the big outcome, then the question I'm always asking is how is this particular pastor leader I'm working with how how are they helping achieve that outcome how is some of their practices hindering that outcome so the kind of questions I'm asking as I assess models of training I've been I've been sitting under um, and I've been blessed to be with men and women who have been self 
aware enough to let me ask those questions yeah. and, and robust enough to recognise their strengths and weaknesses. Yeah. Uh, pray God for more of it. Yeah. This is where we, need, it, to, we it, need to strengthen the hand of God. It's so college. significant, I think, about the humility question, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, um, well, I mean, we keep saying to students, uh, if, if you get one thing out of being at college, <laughs> um, if you can leave here being humble enough to, to keep yeah, learning, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, to keep learning. Because you, you can't learn if you're not humble. Yeah. So if, you, if nobody can tell you that there's something wrong with you, you can't change. Yeah. You are stuck where you are. You will never learn and grow. Yeah. Uh, and you won't change your habits or the way that you interact and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a oh, glory to growth. Oh, it's beautiful. There's a glory to growth, isn't it? This, yeah. is the, um, this is the great thing that God is about in our lives, mm. transforming us from one degree of glory to, to another. another. Yeah. And so to fight for humility that you might be a different person in 10 years' time than you were, I mean, that's the whole journey, <laughs> isn't it? That's yeah. the point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, one of the motifs... Uh, that we see in the Old Testament and even in the New is, is that of bad shepherds. Yep. Um, unfortunately, in recent time with sadness, we've seen a number of um, you know high profile leaders you know, fall out of ministry. We've seen even low profile leaders fall out of ministry. Yep. Um, can you speak to speak to that and an encouragement, I guess, to those listening to to not be that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the the picture in Ezekiel is awful, right? Mm. So he talks about like the. Um, you know, the sheep that kind of butt people out of the way, the shepherds that feed the, on the meat of the actual sheep that they're looking after. So they're, they're kind of ugly, evil images. Mm. Um, but I just think, um, like, we need to be realistic too about the nature of the human heart, about who we are as people. Um, heading into any leadership role, there are so many questions about our sense of identity and value and who we are wanting to achieve, wanting to do good things, even really good motives, mm. um, you end up in certain spaces where out of a lack of your own resources, out of a lack of other people, particularly I think being able to speak into your life, um, you end up creating habits or structures that you think are creating good ends. Um, and again, I, I just want to keep coming back to, I think the humility piece is significant because ministry is so stressful uh, under stress, you kind of revert to type. So whatever it is that your stress behaviours are, you'll go there semi-regularly mm. um, in order just to soothe your own stress even. So if it's like deep, intimate involvement with people, you will keep going there because it makes you feel good and it makes mm. you feel useful and like you're doing something. Mm. Or if it's kind of writing the perfect sermon is your thing, then you'll keep going there and doing that because that's the mm. thing that makes you feel good. Um, and I, I suspect that for many people who end up in some of those really dark places, there wasn't a moment when they set off to be malicious. Mm. It's just that the stress and pressure without letting any kind of outside influences speak into the reality of who they were and how that was impacting the system that they were a part of meant that they were allowed to go a long way down a particular path mm. before people started to put their hands up and say, yeah. wow, this is having a massive impact on, on us. Um, but that's the I, I just think that's the reality for if we are serious about the doctrine of sin mm. and we actually believe that that's a problem for me and my own heart i will know that there but for the grace of god go i right so self, self-awareness is, is important having a, a right understanding of your, your own heart there, there's importance in actually, actually pastors uh being open with one another having that accountability with each other yep. meeting regularly yeah um, that that's a key part of the development program it's what we're trying to facilitate through the REACH thing, yeah. It is, um, there's a couple of little uh, wisdom pieces that's in, that I'd offer there too. It's, um, you'd wish that could be possible within your own congregation. You'd wish it were possible that you could have yeah. peers within church, uh, that you can have that kind of honesty and so on and so forth with. And um, it's a beautiful ideal. And I, I must say, I think now after 25 years, I have it. Mm. Um, there are people who have journeyed with me for so long that I've got such trust with and know so well um, that that is possible. It's pretty, it was pretty hard for the first 10 years because you didn't quite know who you were going to have to call out in a pastoral relationship. Um, and so there's a danger in too quickly being transparent and opening yourself up to this kind of engagement within church. Mm. Um, over time, I think it is possible, but it takes a long time. Whereas to meet with others outside of your church, 
uh, often pastoral leaders themselves. That's a more immediate, healthier context to have that happening. The problem, though, is that they don't see what's happening. Yeah. And so, the problem is we, we can lie as part. We, we can lie. To yeah, our you know, um, and there's where the within church is powerful. Mm. Um, but these things are all complex, and it does come. I, I, I think Paul's right. It comes in the end. Uh, it's your humility and what you bring to it. Because mm. you can try and set up structures that you'll hide from, you'll deceive yourself in, mm. you'll yeah. manipulate. Um, but you must do them. Mm. It just, it's the deceptiveness of sin though, isn't it? Totally. So I can even create a structure to make it look like <laughs> I'm, being ac- I'm being accountable. That's exactly right. um, and, But I'm doing that for the wrong motives. I actually think the question of like, what are your motives when you enter into those spaces? If you've created structures outside of your environment, which you should, that are actually asking questions and kind of inviting you to think deeply about your leadership, you've got to enter into those willing to actually be challenged, corrected, let people kind of speak into your heart and say, you know, (laughs) do you have you really thought about what you're doing there and why you're doing it? Mm. Um, And being willing to kind of stick your hand up and say, well, actually, yeah, at the moment, it's not good. I yeah. need, there are things I need to repent of. There's that kind of stuff. Um, and I think too, like my other observation is, like Andrew, you were saying, it's over time you've gotten to the point of having people you can talk into your life. Um, but there's also the reality that over time, um, as you grow as a leader or whatever, there's fewer and fewer people in your congregation who feel able to talk into your life yeah, as well, right? Yeah, so there's yeah. that kind of yeah. tension that yeah, goes yeah, yeah, on. Yeah, totally right. It, it, the other little piece in this that I think uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful little cliche, I guess, in our culture, which is let your critics be your coaches, that little line. Mm. But it's actually a good one. You know? <laughs> yeah. And, and um, so I, I, I think a, a piece that tests your humility and strengthens it mm is to genuinely listen to the critique, which we'll have. You know, it'll be 80% wrong, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> that's the 80-20 rule. That's the <laughs> but find at least 20%. 20%, okay. <laughs> find something in it that has something to say to you, and, um, and you'll probably discover there was more within it than you realise. <laughs> but, it, but it is, uh, it's making a habit of, of heeding that and actually giving yourself time to listen yeah. to it and see what is it in it that you need to learn. Um, marriage is a, is a powerful thing in this too. Um, you love it and you hate it. Asking your wife how the sermon was in the car on the way home. I don't want to go You've through there. No. <laughs> I don't want to go there now. But it's a, it's a good thing to teach your wife not just to pat your back but to, um, you know, to to call you out. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you've been advocating uh, team pastoring. Sometimes. You've been advocating team pastoring. You know, some would say that, you know, some critics of that would say that's not pastoring um, in the sense uh, that the pastor doesn't have a congregation. Uh, they don't have a direct, you know, face to the people in, in the church. Um, can you push into, you know, why team pastoring is pastoring? Sorry, do you want me to ask that question differently? No, no, that's, so good. that's, that's bit, good. I've changed tack and we've gone into a different area. But no, that's good. Yeah. It is, I mean, yeah, you can see from Acts 20 and the Ephesian elders, there's a sense in which um, the elders represent congregations in some measure. So is it a kind of Presbyterianism where, you know, the Ephesian church has a series of house churches with an elder in each mm. who each come together as a kind of the presbytery? Is, it, is that what's happening and Paul meets with them in some fashion? We don't know. Mm. You know, there's, it's very slight information and evidence, isn't it? Um, but what is certainly the case that is that the elder has a role in a gathering of people, not just a role in a function. Mm. I think I think I'd I think I'd agree that there's a kind of a benchmark, um, but there's ways to perform functions that continue to exercise a um, community of people life. Um, and I think it's, there's a danger in some people's minds that there's an either-or thing. Mm. That if I end up responsible for a purpose or function, I've stopped being involved in a congregation pastorally as a, as a pastor model there. But I, I don't think it needs to be as... It, it can be done that way and that would be wrong. And the language of pastor-teacher as well, there's a, there's a sense of if I'm not preaching to my people, then I'm not pastoring my people either. 
that's that's another and and i'd offer there the danger there is that we've we've heightened the pulpit teaching ministry to be the teaching ministry mm. so you know there's many word activities in church life beyond the pulpit mm. Le- not... lead- leadership is discipleship yeah, yeah 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 exercised through the grid and lens of the scriptures and mm. so on applying them into people's lives but there's lots of ways to bring the word to bear um, though the pulpit is a chief one um, but if you have a if you have a leader in your church who's not ever in the pulpit that doesn't mean they're not a pastor um, unless they're not exercising word ministry in any way mm. I think that might be I think that might be as far as you could go with it. Yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah. Like Ke- Keller talks about in his little preaching book, kind of talks about th- what he calls three levels of word ministry, and he said there's the kind of the public preaching, which kind of sets the framework and shape of yeah. everything, yeah. and then there's people who exercise all sorts of word ministries within the life of yeah. the church, um, who actually are, are shaped and moulded by that overall teaching, but are then engaging with that and living it out and talking about it in their space yeah. and then there's the the low level just people sh- doing the word with one another mm. sharing the truth with one another yeah. rebuking exhorting encouraging etc etc at that kind of level yeah uh, and i think it's helpful to realize that lots of those at least the level two ones if we're going to use that as a kind of picture are happening in our church all the time and just not being the person in the pulpit doesn't stop shouldn't stop you actually from exercising word ministry or and if you've got a function like there's an area of church life that you're responsible yeah. for if you're not teaching people how to do that from a biblical framework yeah. you're completely failing aren't that, you? that's exactly right, right. That, that, and you can it, it is possible to construct a team pastoring model that just imagines you've got leaders who are simply running organizational pieces in it yeah um, but that would be uh, that's not inherent in thinking team pastoring it's a way of misapplying mm. what we're talking about, but it's not inherent in it. it, it exactly right. It's, uh, everyone we want leading a part of church life, a function of church life or whatever, yeah. we wanted to do it with the Bible in hand. We wanted to do it through a lens of the scriptures. We wanted to do it in a way that enhances the word on everybody's lips. You know, and, and, uh, and that's genuine team pastor. There's, there's where the body's at work, the gifts of the body are at work. Um, and, and I want to push even further into that there is a really deep personal element to that, right? So say, you're, say you're, you're doing the music thing, but you've got members of your music team who are struggling with sin or who are yeah. engaging in unhealthy ways in relationships with other team members and whatever. Like, it's genuinely your job to bring the word to bear mm. on them, to yeah. challenge, to rebuke, to exhort, whatever else it is that you need to do in that space. Um, and if that's not, like that's disciple making, right? Mm. So when you're doing a function, you're doing it with people and you're doing it in a space with people where your job is actually to grow them in the likeness of Christ. Yeah. So. And I do, I, I think it's worth exploring the language of elder deacon too as well. There's, um, you know, our word deacon has kind of evolved to often simply mean the, you know, the waiting on tables, the administrative yeah. function. Mm. But there are some indications and evidences that that, that word, that the idea deacon was go between. It's the, it's it's not so much waiting on tables. It's the it's the go between. And there's a possibility that the deacons in the first century function as the go between between the elder, and the congregation, in some fashion that they took a word ministry into the house. Mm. Um, and it might be partly why, you know, women were deacons because they would go into the the, the house of a single woman, the widow, um, but bring the word in that exercise. So Philip and others. Um, exercise word ministries and there you have therefore a um, a breadth and depth first level second perhaps two mm. uh, of word activities mm. where the body's functioning uh, as a team as a healthy community with different gifts brought to bear so, yeah. so big big picture let's let's pull right back uh, you're training the next generation of, of pastors. Trying. Trying. Yeah. Having a go, <laughs> having a crack. What would you like to see change in Australian pastors? Oh, this is going to sound really funny. I actually think we need to persuade more people that being the guy who's in charge is a noble thing and that they need to get there. Um, I think um, one of the things... Uh, this is within Anglicanism, right? So that's my part of the the mm. ministry world. Um, I think we've got lots of guys who want to be an assistant 
because there's a nice neat package that they understand that doesn't involve holding any of the other pieces together. So I get to do the stuff that I really enjoy and the stuff that I don't enjoy, someone else has to kind of manage that. Mm. Um, I think we are struggling a bit to persuade people to take up the responsibility over overall organisational piece of the whole thing. Um, so I think mm. this might sound a bit against everything that we've just said, but I actually think in the system that I'm part of, we need to persuade young guys uh, with the gifts and skills to keep working on the personal, intentionally personal, kind of deeply personal stuff, but on having the kind of vision and energy that's going to take them to taking responsibility for things where there's bits of it that they're going to have to carry that aren't fun, but are actually necessary for leading organisations and taking them somewhere. That, that's, that's a sorry. recent thing. You think? Uh, that's a ve- I think it's a very recent thing. I think it's been driven by a bunch of things within our system. So the creation of the permanent diaconate um, Mm -hmm. has kind of created a space where lots of people want to do that 2IC job because in a sense you you get a congregation, you get to preach, you get to um, do stuff with people, but you don't carry kind of the weight of responsibility for the organisation, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's a hard job, but we really need people who are deeply grounded in the word and with the gifts and skills organisationally and whatever else but to be the person who sits in that seat, I think that's a significant thing for us in the space that I'm working in. But that may be different from Just where you guys are. Yeah, no, it's interesting. It, um, I mean, there'll be a number of factors at work there as to why that's a lack at the moment, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. But that is interesting. For, for mine, I, you know, um, I, I think what, what I'd love to see is a, is a growth in gospel ambition. Mm. I think... Um, you know, I think it's a broad thing, um, and it's uh, you know I'd say it's a spiritual reason for this, which is that sin and Satan don't want us to have it, and um, and so it will always be the challenge to raise up leaders and Christians who have a have a big gospel ambition, who are convinced of heaven and hell, the death of Jesus, why it matters so much, God's vision for the world, uh, the brevity of life, and so on, that they they will pay whatever price to see the gospel go forward, churches grow. Um, gospel ambition, I think, is a massive ingredient we need to see cultivated ongoingly uh, in young pastors in, in middle and older because I think it fades and is lost yeah. because of sin, of sin and Satan. Yep. This is a spiritual battle, I think. It's, mm. not, just a, it's not just an organisational thing that it's easy to forget. It's actually a, there's an active, we know the schemes of Satan, who's seeking to dampen this. And so we've got to keep pushing for it. And I think one of the challenges for colleges is that they, um, they need to keep infecting everything, uh, you know, doing Greek, you know, how to work out to infect every piece that they bring to bear in a student's life for the cause of the gospel, um, not just the skill of the job. Mm. Um, now, we're blessed with colleges that have, but we just need to keep encouraging them in that as well. I think so. Uh, so as we as we think about pastoral ministry, uh, is there something that we can uh, bring to bear in this conversation about men and women in ministry? Yeah, I, look, I, I I think the more we embrace the idea of uh, a team pastoring model rather than a kind of a perhaps what might be regarded as an older model where it's the solo pastor who does the generalist everything. Um, one of the great strengths of thinking more body life together, team pastoring together, is that men and women together uh, exercise uh, leadership, ministry, word activity in the body of Christ. We have tended towards um, a kind of women's ministry model which sometimes isolates the women's part of church off. Mm. Um, And I think that's a great sadness and tragedy where we're losing the gifts of women for the whole body uh, and we can do that in a context where we take seriously 1 Timothy 2, um, the, a complementarian model of church life, but find greater opportunities for the genuine bringing to bear of women and men in our life together, for sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a fascinating piece of research. Um, Google ran this thing called Project Aristotle. They were trying to work out how to make teams work well in their organisation. Because um, there's a in, in psychology, there's a thing called general intelligence. You kind of give people a set of questions. If they do well on that, they can do well on a whole range of tasks. Mm-hmm. And they're asking the question, is there anything that you can measure that helps you to know what makes kind of a, a group of people work together to get a task done? 
Um, and they look for all sorts of things like the maximum IQ of the person in the group or all these kinds of things. None of those things matched with kind of performance on task-based activities. Um, the things that they eventually worked out were um, conversational turn-taking, um, a, a reasonable participation of everybody who's part of the group, and the number of women in the group actually affected the outcome of small groups of people trying to achieve tasks mm -hmm. in terms of their ability to actually achieve the goal or whatever it was mm. that was set. Uh, and they ran a whole, uh, there was another team at Carnegie Mellon who'd run a whole series of experiments in this place that basically said, so um, there are actually elements of kind of how we involve women in our teams and in our life together and whatever that's really significant, I think, in terms of who they are and the gifts that they bring into that space affect the way that we do ministry together. And what, what's beautiful there, isn't it, is, is that um, we should have known this. We should have, right? <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like the, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. Um, the, the script, I mean, you just go through the pattern of seeing women engaged in the ministries of church life through the New Testament. Yeah. And um, there, there was, there, there's always been a, a, a sense that God has gifted us both to work together towards the outcomes. And, you know, the, the, the women who prophesy and pray and, uh, you know, the great patroness, the supporters of the ministry and so on. It's mm. an extraordinary kind of range of activities. So a complementarian framework, a, a faithfulness to that concern um, ought never show itself in some kind of uh, simplistic segregation of our work as we've often done. Mm. Um, and I think capturing again this team pastoring model picks up these, these clearly positive outcomes that are achieved together. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's significant too in terms of the formation of young pastors. One of the things that we started to realise at college is we have, uh, we, we employ a bunch of women who come on as the campus one day a week as chaplains to meet with the women. But we've started to encourage them to meet at least once or twice across the course of the year with the blokes who are in the group that they're part of. Yeah. Um, because the, the men actually learn stuff from them that they aren't learning from, you know. And so they need the input of older women in their life in yeah. terms of just making sense of who they are and how they do ministry. Um, however, we can find spaces of, for relationship um, for our men and women to actually contribute their, get, their gifts to Together. one another yeah. and their scriptural knowledge yeah. and their wisdom and stuff yeah. are in the life of the body. I just think it's really significant. Yeah, it's so, powerful. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. Well, it's great that you joined us in this really important discussion. You can find more great resources on reachaustralia.com.au.